In this lesson, we're going to be talking about the states of refrigerant and the complete refrigeration cycle as you see in an air conditioning system. Okay, We're going to start off with the four main components. These are in all refrigeration systems, and it doesn't work really well without any of these. Actually, it won't work at all without some of these. Okay, The compressor is the heart of the refrigeration system. Okay, It is a vapor pump. Notice vapor. You cannot have any liquid flowing into the compressor or can damage the compressors. The condenser is the next part. What it does, it actually rejects the heat. Our whole purpose of air conditioning is to take the heat from a place we don't want it, which is the inside of the building or the space you're trying to air condition, and we move it to a place where you do want it, okay, which is outside. So the condenser is the part that actually rejects the heat. It moves the heat out of the refrigerant into the outside environment. So what it's doing is de-superheat, it condenses, and it subcools. De-superheating is basically taking the heat that's coming out of the inside of the building, okay, plus the heat generated by the compressor, and lowering it to the temperature where the refrigerant can condense do a change of state from a vapor to a liquid. Once the condensation process occurs, the refrigerant further drops in temperature, which is called subcooling. The condenser in an air conditioning system is always larger than the evaporator. It can be air or water cooled, but the majority of the condensers you are going to see in our shops, as well as in residential and small or light commercial environments are gonna be air cooled. You go outside next to your house, you'll probably see a condenser sitting there. Okay, the metering device is your next part of the system. The metering device is designed to lower the pressure of the refrigerant as it enters the evaporator. Back here, coming out of the condenser, you have high pressure liquid. Okay, the metering device acts like a finger over the end of a garden hose. Okay, it takes this high pressure liquid and allows a little bit at a time to spray into the evaporator. That means the pressure in the evaporator is much lower than the pressure in the liquid line behind it. Okay, when the pressure is lowered, the boiling point drops. Okay, the temperature of boiling points and the pressure are directly proportional. If you drop the pressure, the boiling point drops. If you raise the pressure, the boiling point increases, and that goes along with Charles' law of ideal gases. Then you have the evaporator. The evaporator is where the heat absorbs. It lowers the sensible heat of the air surrounding it. It removes the latent heat of the water vapor, which is humidity, that is in the air. Now, the whole principle behind the evaporator, and we're going to go in more detail of this, is that this low-pressure refrigerant coming into the evaporator has a boiling point that is lower than the air surrounding it. Okay, so if the air surrounding it is 80 degrees, my boiling point might be at 32 degrees or 35 degrees. Most often we want 35 degrees in air conditioning so we don't freeze anything. But so when a substance boils off like a liquid refrigerant, as it boils, it, it takes heat to make this refrigerant boil. Well, the heat is absorbed from the air that's blowing across the evaporator coil, and that actually gets transferred into what becomes a vapor refrigerant coming out of the evaporator. Now, we have some additional components. There are some additional components that you don't see in every system. You have a sight glass. A sight glass, okay, it allows you to basically see into the refrigeration system. Do not use this as a method of charging a system or evaluating a system. A site glass also has a moisture indicator inside of it. That is probably the most important part of the site glass. There's a little moisture indicator. We do not want moisture or water in our refrigeration systems. It causes the compressor oil to become acidic and it will eventually burn out the windings. Okay, the site glass will also let you see if there's bubbles or anything or signs of refrigerant movement in there. Do not count on a sight glass though for proper charging. Next to the sight glass most often before it, we have a filter dryer. Okay, a filter dryer is found in most systems but it's not required. The filter dryer will 
cat trap particulate matter and moisture. The moisture is absorbed by a desiccant and held there to slow the formation of acids. Any time a system is open to the air, in other words, the refrigerant is recovered and replaced and open, the system's open to air, you need to change that filter dryer. It will actually save your compressor in the long run. Now, there's three definable copper lines in a refrigeration system. First, you have a discharge line that goes from the compressor to the inlet of the condenser. Then you have a liquid line from the outlet of the condenser to the inlet of the metering device. Then you have a suction line from the outlet of the evaporator to the inlet of the compressor. We're also going to talk about some states of refrigerant. Okay. Now, these initials you'll see on the following slides. HP is high pressure. HT is high temperature, LP is low pressure, LT is low temperature, SHV stands for superheated vapor, and SCL stands for subcooled liquid. So let's start off with the discharge line. Our discharge line is found in the top right hand corner of this slide. Okay, and you should be able to see my pointer at it right now. Okay, the discharge line contains a high pressure high temperature superheated vapor. Now we call it superheated because it's a very high sensible heat. In other words, you can feel how hot it is because it not only includes the heat that was taken out of the space we're trying to cool through the boiling process in the evaporator, but it also includes the heat of compression. Anytime you compress a vapor or air, it creates heat. So it takes that superheated vapor and it pushes it out through the discharge line at a high pressure, high temperature into my condenser. Remember, the condenser first desuperheats, then condenses, and then subcools. Once the refrigerant is now a subcooled liquid, it moves into my liquid line. That's why it's called a liquid line. It's a subcooled liquid. It's still high pressure. It's still considered high temperature but it's a subcooled liquid, okay? And the liquid line includes the site glass and the filter dryer present. It starts at the outlet of the condenser and goes to the metering device. Our refrigerant then sprays into the evaporator, okay? Boils off, is superheated, and comes into the suction line as it leaves the evaporator it is a low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor where it moves into the inlet of the compressor. So again, our entire cycle includes our discharge line, our condenser, our liquid line with optional filter dryer and sight glass, our metering device, and our evaporator. Okay, subcooling occurs in the last half of the condenser. Okay, in other words, we come in as a gas or a superheated vapor. We condense from that vapor to that liquid. Then we further cool, okay, under what's considered its saturation point. That's the point where all the vapor becomes a liquid. We further cool it down. The higher the subcooling number, the more heat the system will absorb. Superheating, which is the opposite of subcooling, occurs in the last half of the evaporator. Superheat is the temperature vapor above its saturation point. In other words, we're absorbing heat through the boiling process, which is a latent heat change. We're going from a liquid to a vapor, but then we're still absorbing some heat as that refrigerant leaves the evaporator. The lower the superheat number, the more danger there is of, sluggling, of slugging, which means sending liquid refrigerant back to the valves of the compressor. Now, superheat in most systems, unless the manufacturer tells you other, is found between 8 and 12 degrees. Flash gas occurs at, with the pressure drop at the outlet of the metering device. Okay, flash gas is basically a low pressure okay, low pressure liquid that immediately is flashing off to a gas, okay? So it's a combination of a liquid and vapor and it occurs right at the outlet of the metering device. What it does, it actually helps lower the temperature of that refrigerant. 
okay? When we take a look at the second law of thermodynamics, it says that heat, which is energy, flows from an area where there is no energy, cold, to hot, okay? So heat will always flow from hot to cold, okay? That's why the evaporator absorbs the heat from the air passing through it. So by, by the second law of thermodynamics, if I blow warm air across this evaporator coil, the heat is going to be absorbed into the coil because there's a lack of energy or heat inside the coil. It's also why the temperature of the refrigerant must be greater than the ambient air. Ambient air just means air surrounding something. So on the outside system, we raise this pressure, we raise the temperature, so that heat will always flow out of the refrigerant into the air blowing across the coil, which it rejects that heat into the evaporator. Okay, that's why we need to maintain a compression ratio of at least 3.5 to 1 and not more than 10 to 1. The compression ratio basically says the pressure coming in with relationship to the pressure going out. We're going to be talking a lot about refrigerants throughout this course, okay? We have to worry about quality of refrigerants. There are certain things we're looking for in refrigerants. For refrigerant to be used by our industry, there are some important guidelines. The three main ones are it must be stable. Okay, refrigerant on its own cannot break down. It has to be able to go through the change of state billions of times in its lifetime. It cannot lose its molecular structure nor change its chemical makeup on its own. It must not be flammable, okay? The flammability must be very low to non-existent. It's under pressure and that would become a real problem or a ticking time bomb in the presence of a fire. It would create an explosion possibility if the unit was leaking into an enclosed structure just like natural gas or liquid petroleum gases. So we cannot have flammable refrigerant. It has to be non-toxic. Occasionally leaks happen, okay, and leaks in a closed environment can cause problems with toxicity, okay. It is still dangerous because its ability to displace oxygen and become an asphyxiate, but it must be non-toxic, okay. For refrigerants to work as efficiently as possible, they also have to have a low heat of evaporation or a boiling point. It has to be the further apart the temperatures are, the faster the heat transfers and the more efficient the unit will be. So when you look at this slide, this sort of wraps up everything we talked about. So we have our four main components of the system. We have our compressor, we have our evaporator, we have our condenser, and we have our metering device. We have two points of pressure change. It's this red line across the center. Our two points of pressure change is the metering device and the compressor. So everything on the right side of it, okay, is high pressure. Everything on the left side of it on this slide is low pressure. We have two points of change of state. Change of state basically says vapor to liquid or liquid to vapor, okay? That is in the center of the evaporator and the center of the condenser. So everything under that point is a liquid. Everything over that point is mostly a vapor. Okay. We've learned that our condenser desuperheat condenses and subcools. Okay. We've learned that our evaporator does the exact opposite thing. Okay. It boils, evaporates, and superheats. Okay. The evaporator absorbs heat. The condenser rejects heat, okay? The saturation point, the condensing point, and the bubble point are all interchangeable terms. You'll see them. The saturation point, the evaporating point, the boiling point, and the dew point, again, are all interchangeable terms. You'll see them used depending on what manufacturer you look at. So that basically wraps up a quick description of the refrigeration cycle.